You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 14. Again, as we are normally, the regular diet of the church, we go through a whole book of the Bible. Um, but uh, at this time, we are just making our way through this portion of Genesis, studying the, the life of Abraham to, to learn something about the faith of Abraham. As we know that, we'll see next week in chapter 15, that uh, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so we are preparing then, going through the study, to enter into a, a study in the book of Romans in the fall. And so to learn something about that faith by which we are justified, by which we are made right before God, credited with righteousness. And and that's that's Paul's whole point going through the book of Romans. So we are preparing for that, looking at the faith of Abraham, who at this point in our study, his name has not been changed to Abraham yet. He's still called Abram. But as you turn there to Genesis chapter 14, I want us to think about the fact that throughout Scripture, we see this idea of war, uh, especially in the Old Testament. Though in the New Testament, we do see Jesus uh, tell of wars and rumors of wars that will come. And in Revelation, uh, we see that as the end draws near, there will be wars. And there will be a, a global war, unlike anything that we've seen so far. And there is a day coming when all of the nations will gather against God's chosen nation, Israel. And when all seems bleak, when there seems to be no hope for the people of Israel, that they are about to be wiped out, it's in that moment that Jesus Christ will return. And he will return as a conquering warrior. And by nothing more than the command from his mouth, he will destroy all of Israel's enemies. And he will establish his kingdom on earth, and he will reign on earth for a thousand years until, as we saw this past Easter, he returns, he turns his kingdom over to the Father. And the kingdom of the Son merges with the eternal kingdom of the Father, and our triune God will reign over all for all eternity. And so there is a day that 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 war is coming. And and in that day, that world war will truly be the war to end all wars. But until then, there will continue to be war. But throughout the scriptures, we see that God is sovereign over all things, even war. And as we see in the Old Testament, and as we're told about that that war in Revelation, uh, we're told of Armageddon. We see that God is the one who gives victory in war. He is sovereign, and so for his sovereign purposes, he is working all things out, even in the wickedness of man and all that they do. And it is God who determines who the victor will be. And that's really, too, what we see this morning. As we see Abram, he must go to war for a just cause. And it is the Lord who gives him the victory. Last week we saw how due to Abram's and Lot's growth in wealth and their animals, that being in the land, being in Canaan, that was also filled with the Canaanites and the uh, Perizzites, that they were unable to be sustained in the land. So having learned from his previous experience going down into Egypt, where Abram took matters into his own hands as opposed to trusting God, and in taking matters into his own hands, he brought a threat to the promises that God had made to him. And yet, nonetheless, God remained faithful. Even through Abram's unfaithfulness, God was faithful, and he preserved the promises he made to Abram. And so, again, Abram learned from that experience. And instead of acting selfishly, instead of acting without faith, he trusted God. And so, as this conflict rises between him and his nephew Lot, he he gives Lot the option of where he should go that they need to separate from each other. And so Lot gets his choice of where to go. And Lot chose for himself the lush, Eden-like area in the Jordan Valley. And so we see Lot moves 
to where he's now then living near Sodom, that wicked, evil place. Abram, on the other hand, trusting God, remained in the land that God promised to give him. And so in doing so, God reiterates his promise to give Abram and his offspring that land. Now, as we continue here, we see Lot has moved from being near Sodom to being in Sodom. And how long has it been? We could ask that. How long has it been since Abram and, and Lot parted ways? text doesn't really tell us, but it would seem that at least a few years has passed. But what we see here is the first bout, at least the first bout that's recorded for us. We see the first bout of trouble that comes to Lot for having moved into the Jordan Valley, having moved near and now in to Sodom. Here as well, we see Abram begins to be a person of great significance as he is bound to be a great nation. And so as we read this, we are reading what Moses was writing to the people of Israel that he had just led out of slavery, just led out of Egypt, and it was leading them to the promised land, to Canaan, that God had promised to give to Abraham and them, Abram's descendants. And as we read this, we should be asking ourselves, what is it that Moses was, was writing to the Israelites for them to walk away with, for them to understand? as he was writing this account of Abram's victory over these invaders into the promised land. What is it that Israel was to learn? Well, we've already been asking that question throughout this study, and we need to continue to ask that question as we continue on. And so as we think about that, let us read our passage here for this morning, as we read Genesis chapter 14. Now, as you notice, we'll read, this is one of those chapters with a lot of names, and you know, chapters with a lot of names are always fun because those names are always so easy to pronounce. So just ask for your grace and that you would bear with me. Here we go. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elassar, Kedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedorlaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated Rephaim in Ashereth Carnaim, Zuzim in Ham, Eman in Shiva Caratham, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon, Tamer. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Kedor Lamer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, and Raphael, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ashkol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, 
and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. And he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. After his return from the defeat of Kedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemy into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but the young men, but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Ashkel, and Mamre take their share. Now, what do we see going on here uh, as we look at this passage? Specifically, first of all, as we look at verses 1 through 12. Here we see the city-states that had joined forces together. It's clear here that five city-states were in servitude to Kedorlaomer, the king of Elam. And these city-states were his vassals, meaning he had conquered them. And so for them to be able to keep the peace and to be relatively free, they had to pay tributes to this king. And they would do this for 12 years. But then they all decided that they weren't going to do that anymore. And so in the 13th year, they rebelled. And there may have been other city-states that rebelled in some way too, but these five city-states that are mentioned here, which included Sodom and Gomorrah, band together as Kedor Lamer and his allies made their way west and south, because they were from the area of Mesopotamia, so they made their way west and south, and as they went, they crushed and pillaged the Canaanite rebel cities, until they made their way into southern Canaan. And they moved from city-state to city-state until they had circled back around to come into the south of Canaan and into the Transjordan area, which is on the east side of the Jordan River. We see here in verse 8, it tells us that the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and their allies joined battle in the valley of Siddim. Now verse 3 tells us that Siddim is where the Salt Sea is. The Salt Sea is the ancient name for the Dead Sea. Remember, we've already talked about the Dead Sea, right? And how much really lives in the Dead Sea? Not very much, right? That's why it's the Dead Sea. And it was because of its high salt content. And so we see here the ancient name for that is the Salt Sea. And so you have these five kings and their armies defending against these four Mesopotamian kings. But they can't stand against these four kings. And so Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled. And as we read it here, it seems that there, there may have been this, these obstacles in the way of their fleeing. There were these bitumen or these tar pits. And so it says that many in the army of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fell into these pits where the rest of the armies fled to the hill country. At least that's how it reads in the English Standard Version. The Hebrew, though, could indicate that not that they just fell into these pits, but that they threw themselves into these pits. And so given the idea that they hid themselves in these pits, uh, which would take some knowledge of the area. They'd have to know where the rocks were and where they could set and where they could put themselves to hide among these pits. So again, many of the army of Sodom and Gomorrah, they, they hid themselves while the rest had retreated to the hill country. And therefore, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were left defenseless. And so these four allied kings raided and plundered the cities. And we read there in verse 12, it says, They also took Lot, the, sons of, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and they took his possessions and went their way. 
Now, as we think about this, these foreign kings invading into the promised land, into Canaan, so we think about this, this could raise some questions to us and, and make us ask, how is God going to keep his promise to Abram to give him this land when there's these powerful kings and their allies? And they hold these other kings that are already in the promised land under a heavy hand. How in the world is he going to give Abram this land? How is he going to preserve it for Abram's offspring? How can God's promise really be secure in a situation like this? But as we've already mentioned, looking at the life of Abram, God is faithful. And God is sovereign. God is in complete control over all. And so God will faithfully bring about all his promises, no matter the circumstances, no matter what takes place. And we've seen that already, right? Even as Abram goes down into Egypt and gets himself in trouble, lying about Sarai, that, that she's just his sister and not his wife. And we see all that transpires and how there was a threat in that circumstance that was brought onto God's promises, brought against God's promises, and yet God remained faithful even through that circumstance, and preserved his promise to Abram. Well, again, we can see and trust God's faithfulness. God is faithful no matter what goes on, no matter what the surrounding circumstances are, that he will keep his promises. The truth of the matter is, there is nothing that can thwart God's promises. Nothing that can stop God's plans. Nothing. Nothing gets in the way of what he is doing. Nothing even slows him down and slows down the progression of, of how he's planned things out. The things slow down our plans, right? Things get in the way of our plans. Our timeline doesn't always work out, but nothing hinders God's timeline. When things seem to threaten our plans and even ruin our plans, we have to understand and trust nothing can threaten God's plans. Nothing can ruin his plans. Nothing at all. All things are working out according to what he has preordained for his purposes. How many times, j just through this series, which we haven't been into that long, how many times have we already mentioned God's purposes and how God's purposes are always righteous and always good. And so with faith, we must trust God and his purposes. And understand nothing will get in the way of what he's doing. And so even as we're sitting at home and maybe watching the news, and we see the things that are happening in the world, we hear about Vladimir Putin, and we hear about Xi Jinping, and however we hear about what they're doing, and, and we think, wow, that, that's, that's, that's kind of scary. You know, what, what could transpire from all of that? That's, that's nerve-wracking at the least. Or whatever else that we could see happening in our own country and, and the politics in our country and all that's transpiring on, on the federal level, the state level, and even the local level. And we think, wow, that's, that's messed up. Not even that. And so we just think about the things that are happening in our own personal lives. We need to remember, God is working his will for his purposes. And his purposes cannot fail. And so as we think of God's purposes, his plan and his promises to Abraham, those plans, those purposes, cannot, would not, and did not, fail. Now, again, in the defeat of Sodom's army and the ransacking of that city, Lot and all he had was taken captive. Verse 13 tells us that someone escaped from Sodom. Someone among those that were being carried away and they came to Abram and told him that his relative had been taken away. 
Now, what's interesting here is that we see, for the first time, Abram referred to as a Hebrew. And that might be kind of weird to us, especially this far into the narrative, and and it's kind of odd. And there's some talk about why this is the case here. Uh, For instance, Derek Kidner, in his commentary, suggests that this could show that Moses used a a separate source to tell of the historical event of this war and, and of Abram being drawn into this war possible. Other commentaries talk about how this could be showing that Abram has risen to be recognized as a chief of a tribal clan there in Canaan. I guess that, that's also possible as well. But whatever the reason is, we, we shouldn't really get bogged down with it and, and, and get so focused there that we miss the point of the text. And so we want to look at and see what, what is going on here. What is this teaching us? During all of this conflict, Abram was living far away from everything that was happening. He was on the opposite side of the Dead Sea. And where he was living, it was by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ashkel and Aner. And it would seem that even to temporarily settle there, Abram had to make an agreement with these three brothers and their people. And so they entered into this treaty with one another. And so, in some way, they would all benefit, and it would seem that one of the ways they benefited, that if one of them entered into conflict, the others would join and support them. And so we see this here. So from what we see, clearly these four kings and their armies, after their victory in the Valley of Siddim, they started heading back north with all of the loot and all of their captives. And so along with his own allies... Abram took 318 of his servants, whom apparently he had trained in warfare, and then chased down these four Mesopotamian kings as far north as Dan. And all of this was in order to save Lot. And we read there in verse 15, it says, And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hova, north of Damascus. Some suggest that, since it says that was by night, that this was probably a surprise attack. But in any way, we see some great warfare strategy here. And we see the defeat of these kings. And so Abraham pushes them back as far north, going beyond Damascus. We see here he retrieves all of the loot that they had walked away with, and he rescues the captives, including Lot and all that Lot had. So as we look at this, we can't miss what's going on here. He entered the fray of this conflict between these four kings and these five kings. And as he does this, what is Abraham doing? As he pursues these kings with his own army and with his allies, what's he doing? He himself is acting like a king. He's... Just like these, he, he is himself just like these other powers in this region. And again, God is keeping his promise. God said he was going to make Abram's name great. He said he was going to make Abram into a great nation. And here, even without descendants, he's already acting like a nation. He's going to war, fighting for a just cause. And what more, he won that war. He has the victory. And again, even with that, what's what's going on here? By taking one of Abram's kinsmen, his nephew Lot, these kings have cursed Abram. And so then God used Abram to defeat them, to bring a curse upon them. Right? And, and what did God promise Abram? That he would bless all those who blessed Abram, and he would curse those who cursed him. And we see him doing that. At the same time, too, God also promised that he was going to make Abram into, he was going to bless Abram to make Abram a blessing. Right? And we see that too here. Right? He, he's a blessing to these four kings by defeating their enemy and especially to the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, as he's retrieved all that they had lost. 
God is using him as a blessing. God was doing what he intended to do through Abram, as God always does what he intends to do. There is no promise too great, no circumstance too bleak, that will prevent God from doing all that pleases him to do, which really speaks to his power and his greatness. Matter of fact, Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Which of us can say we do all that we please to do? There's a lot of things that I would be pleased to do that I, I just can't do. Things I, I physically can't do. Things I, I mentally can't do. Things I dimensionally can't do that I might want to do. But I can't. God always does what he pleases to do and always pleases to do everything he does. And he does this because he is so great, so powerful, and he is sovereign over all. Nothing restrains him from what he wants to do. So when we know this about God, and we know his character, that he is faithful, he is holy, he is righteous, and he is good, then we should understand that this is the God that no matter our circumstances, no matter our pain, no matter our fears, no matter our struggles, no matter even our own failures, this is the God we must learn to trust. To learn to trust more and more. And as we learn to trust him in our circumstances more and more, the more we will be obedient to him in our circumstances and honor him in our circumstances. And this is also what Israel had to learn. They had to learn to trust him more and more and trust him in their circumstances. As they made their way to Canaan, they were going to face difficulties. Uh, they were going to face battles to fight with other nations. And they would have to trust that they could prevail through it because God was giving them the land. God promised to give them the land. God was pleased to give them the land. And so in trusting this God, they would see the trust that they should have in him as, as they, they read, as Moses writes about how God gave Abram the victory. And so they could trust they would get the victory as well. Because this is a God, the only God, who does whatever he pleases. So if he was pleased to give them the land, they could trust that they could take the land and therefore take the land. And if we were to continue reading through Genesis into Exodus into Numbers, we would see when they got there to the land how much they really trusted God. Then with this victory won, we see two kings come out to Abram. We see the king of Sodom, which already has been mentioned to us, and then we see this other king who, who this is the first time he's mentioned. He's a very special king, and many point out that he's shrouded in mystery. As we read of Abram's return, we see first that the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the king's valley. And think about this. Again, we have these two kings that come out to meet Abram, and they meet him in the king's valley. Right again, what is all of this pointing us to? These two kings meeting with Abram in the king's valley. What is Abram standing there like? Like one of these kings, right? God is fulfilling everything he said he would do. God is keeping his promise. Abraham is there as a king. though he has not been made into a nation yet. And, and if this place, this valley of the kings, the king's valley, if this is the same king's valley that we read of in 2 Samuel, uh, then this would be just south of the city that we read here that's called Salem. And verse 18 says this, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. 
He was priest of God Most High. And again, most people point out the, the sudden appearing of Melchizedek, wh- whose name means king of righteousness. But on one hand, though, his, his, the suddenness of his appearing isn't all that mysterious when we think about the fact that, that they would be meeting just outside of the city he ruled over. But this is our first introduction to him. As we read of this meeting, um, we're not really told much about the king of Sodom here. We've already read about the city he reigns over, right? It was a a wicked city. Uh, The people of Sodom were great sinners against the Lord. And so that, that might tell us something about his rule and reign as well. But then we read here about Melchizedek. Again, the king of Salem. The word Salem means peace. So this is the city, is a city that will later be called the city of peace, called Jerusalem, Jerusalem, right? And so this is the city that Melchizedek ruled over. Therefore, it's the same city that later on, as Israel is established in the land as their own nation, that King David then will move the capital to Jerusalem. And he will move the center of worship there to Jerusalem, to that city, the city of peace. And this is the king that at this time in Abram's lifetime reigned over that city. And we see here about this king that he is, and he was, the priest of God Most High. He's the priest of the one true God. And so we see this one man holding two separate offices. This one man is both priest and king. Is that something that's familiar to us? Something that 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 shouts at us that that this this man in in some way is very important as we see? Does he remind us of someone else that we're told about who is both priest and king? He should. Matter of fact, there are many who argue because of what we read about Melchizedek in the New Testament book of Hebrews, that they argue that that really Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate Christ. That this is a, a Christophany. This is an appearing of Christ before he took on flesh and became a man. I don't actually lean there. Um, I don't think that's what the author of Hebrews is telling us. Matter of fact, as we read in Hebrews, if we were to turn there, we would see that he tells us that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he quotes David in Psalm 110 to show us that. And so he's a, Jesus is a priest, Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which I think points us, points to us to, to understand that, that he's not Melchizedek. But what is clear is that Melchizedek is a type of Christ or a foreshadowing of Christ, and in this sense is even a prophecy of Christ in his own person. That there is one coming who will be both king and priest. Melchizedek is not that king and priest who is coming, uh, but he foreshadows for us the one who is to come. He is like the one to come in many ways. And so Melchizedek Melchizedek lets us know that there is this special king coming, one who is priest and king. One who is priest and king who will rule in Jerusalem. Just as Melchizedek did. Which then, I think, shows us that when David moved the capital city to Jerusalem and moved the center of worship to Jerusalem, that that wasn't just coincidental. That wasn't just something that just happened. But that was always the plan. That's always what God intended. And it didn't just happen because nothing just happens. Everything is always the plan. We see over and over and over again in Scripture that God is totally sovereign over all things. 
And so here, again, as we're introduced to Melchizedek, what do we see Melchizedek do? Well, first, he, he brings out refreshments to Abraham, to Abram. He shows him hospitality. And he blesses Abram. Again, what did God promise Abram? That he would bless him. And now the priest of God comes out and blesses Abram. And we read of this blessing in verses 19 through 20. Melchizedek said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And isn't, isn't that a significant thing to say? He has delivered your enemies into your hand. Again, so we, we see this declaration by Melchizedek of blessing on Abraham from God Most High, the God who is above all else, the God who stands alone as the supreme ruler over all. He is God Most High who possesses because he created heaven and earth and sovereignly rules over heaven and earth. And then he gives honor to God Most High for delivering Abram's enemies into his hands. And so it's clear here. Why did Abram win the war? Was it because his own 318 servants were so well trained? I mean, they were trained. It tells us that, right? Is that why they won? No. Uh, was it because his allies with the three brothers, Mamre and Ashkel and Aner, was it because they were and their people so numerous? Well, really, the text doesn't even tell us how many of them there were. But no matter what, is that why they won? No, not at all. Why did they win the war? Because God won the war for them. God brought them the victory, as Melchizedek makes very clear. This is the God who promised to bless Abram, and he was keeping his promises, as he always has and always will keep his promises. And then we read, it says, And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Everything that Abram had gained in his victory, he gave a tenth of it to Melchizedek. And this shows that Abram viewed Melchizedek as his superior. As he comes out as the priest of God Most High, as he comes out as the priest of Abram's God. So he gives him a tenth of everything. And so we see here this blessing and honoring of God Most High through Melchizedek. But then the king of Sodom speaks. And you know what the king of Sodom reminds me of? Uh, remember when you were in high school and you had to do those projects, right? Those group projects, right? And uh, maybe it was some sort of science project or something and you had to work together. And what so often happens in those projects where you have to work with other people? There's always someone who does all the work and someone who does nothing. I mean, let's just say, for example, you had to work on a project for a biology class. You had to take care of a, a fiddler crab. Not that I'm thinking of anything specific or hold any bitterness after 20 years. 20 years. Anyway, you have this project. And so you've got to feed the crab and you've got to clean the disgusting terrarium. And every time you go to clean it, you find out the last time it was supposed to be clean, your partner didn't do it. So it's even worse and more disgusting than it would be. But nonetheless, your partner claims and pretends he did anything. And you both get A's. That's what the king of Sodom reminds me of. As we see him come out here, he pretends like he hasn't been hiding in a tar pit. As if he's done anything for the victory, that it wasn't just all Abram. And so he wants to split everything with Abram. Verse 21 says, And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. Now we read here, though, Abram wasn't going to do that. In fact, Abram wasn't going to take anything. Because rather than it look like he had some kind of dealings with this wicked king, Abram, or wicked king of Sodom, Abram would prefer to walk away empty-handed, even though he had rights to what was won in battle. 
If there was any opportunity for this evil king to twist things and make it look like he made Abram what he was, then Abram was not going to take anything. Verse 22 says, But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. So again, Abram would rather take nothing than for anyone to try to steal the glory for themselves. Why? Because the glory belonged to God. And it was Abram's desire for God Most High, who alone deserves honor and glory, to receive that honor and glory. And so, I think the question then reflects back on us. What are we ourselves willing to do or not do? If it means our God receiving honor and glory in our lives, what choices are we willing to make? What even rights are we willing to give up? When there's opportunity before us, when there's temptation to indulge, when there's pleasure to seek, if there's gain to be had, but it would not point to God most high for who he is and all that he has done, if it would not point to him as the God he is, it would not demonstrate that he alone is worthy, then would we be willing to turn it all down, knowing that God alone is worthy of honor and glory? And listen, this would have taken profound humility on Abram's part. Uh, Yes, these things at first had belonged to the king of Sodom, but he lost them. And Abram won them. And yet, so no one could twist things, so this wicked king could not bend things in his favor, Abram, caring more for the glory of God, let it all go. And notice, Abram said here again, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. He takes the the same wording uh, from Melchizedek and, and he makes it very clear that God most high is the Lord. He is Yahweh. He is the one true God. And he knew this God had promised him far more than any of the spoils he could gain in battle. And so knowing God's promises and knowing the God of these promises, Abraham could be content with what God had given him. Abram said in verse 24 then, I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Askel, and Mamre take their share. And really, that's only right. Uh, those who fought for Abram, who, have, who, who gathered with him, uh, those who were Abram's men should get what was rightfully theirs for their service to Abram and the part that they played in serving the king of Sodom. But Abram would take nothing for himself. When we find opportunity to gain, when we think, well, that's my right, right? These are my rights. Can we be humble enough to think clearly and recognize that all these things, all these temporary things, cannot hold a candle to the glory of God Most High? And can we choose what is for his glory and honor, even when it may mean setting aside our rights, even when it means maybe taking a loss, let alone losing out on an opportunity to gain? as we also trust our great God and know the promises that we have in him, know those promises far outweigh whatever we could gain in this temporary life. Remember, we've read already how Abram left his land, left his family, left his father's house, left all that was security for him to go to a place he did not know, only knowing it was where God was going to show him. He left it all, for the God of glory. And last week, with the dispute that rose between Lot and his herdsmen, he could have taken for himself the well-watered, lush, Eden-like place, 
that according to human standards would have been the better choice. But he trusted God and his promises. Trusting that what he had in God was far better. And so in the end, Abram made the right and better choice. And now as we see today, for the sake of God's glory, so that all would know that everything Abram is and all that he had came because of how great his God is. And so the king of Sodom couldn't try to steal the glory for himself. Abram once again relinquished his rights as he sought to glorify God above all else. Can we follow this example? This example of one who knows the God of glory and knows that his glory is more valuable than anything else. Trusting in his promises, knowing that what we have in this God and what we have as you and I sit here today in this God is what is of eternal value. It's not of the temporary nature of anything else in this world. Think about how you and I received all that we have and know God's promises are secure. We have these things because of the sacrifice, because of the infinite payment of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Can we not see then these things far away, anything that we could get from this world? Any treasure, any pleasure, anything at all that we might seek after that is worldly? That is only of the here and now? No, what we have is because of the great God of mercy and grace, who though we deserve wrath because of our sin, sent his son into the world to pay that wrath in our place to come and live the perfect life on our behalf, to give of himself for us on the cross, to settle God's justice and wrath and anger towards our sin in our place so that you and I would never have to, that he died for us and he did not stay dead, but he rose again. And he who is the king and priest lives today, lives for us who believe in him, lives to forever intercede for us. And in him, all of God's promises are yes. He purchased all of those things. It cost the life of the infinite God-man. Can we not see how great these promises are? Can we not see how much we have in God that we could turn our backs on everything in this world and see that we have nothing to gain here in this world and therefore choose to live and choose to the best choice in which is to give honor and glory to this great God of glory? Let us, too, be so humble to live with God's glory as our chief end, trusting that in all we do, in every decision we make, as we seek to honor God, he will indeed honor and glorify himself in us. The God we serve is the same God Abram served. He's the God who does what he pleases. He's the God who gives the victory to whom he wills. The God who is sovereign, who has chosen his people. And so the God who deserves all honor and all glory from his people, from Abraham, from Israel, from us, his church, and from each of us individually in our lives. He is worthy of all honor and glory for us, from us. And he's the only one who is worthy. And so let us live for that honor and glory. Let us seek in every decision we make and everything we do to see that God will glorify himself in this world through us. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.